Um, so good morning. My name is David, and uh, I don't know some of you, or a lot of you actually. Um, so I thought it'd be a good idea if, by way of introduction, I just uh, know that my research focus is on the history and development of spherical media tools and environments. I've been doing this for longer than I'd like to think. Um, and I really explore the potential for cultivating new ways of seeing the world. Um, by expanding our perceptual capabilities. But like Aaron's talk yesterday, this is not going to be a talk about virtual reality. Um, this morning I'm going to look beyond the kind of current bubble of immersive media to examine the broader implications uh, of spherical metaphors and shaping different perceptions of the world, not unlike some of the things that Fred was just talking about. And uh, ironically, I'm going to try to do this on this big rectangle, um, <laughs> which I'm not really used to, <coughs> not really used to doing. So, I want to start by telling a story, kind of a meta-narrative. So for countless generations, cultures around the world have turned to this, this apparent dome of the sky to make sense of the world. It's been widely perceived as a spherical container in large part due to the spherical perspective of human vision and uh, the apparent rotations of the sky that we can see with time-lapse photography pivot around this kind of central point, the central axis of the pole star. And the so-called axis mundi was widely interpreted as a portal to the heavens in cultures all over the world. Our ancestors' very survival depended on their ability to correlate these celestial and terrestrial events, to anticipate the different cycles of life, to synchronize with them, the structures, the flows, and they employed lots of different mediation techniques to symbolize lunar and celestial movements, often kind of intimately connected to fertility cycles, wayfinding, hunting, gathering, timekeeping, all these different necessary things for human existence. Um, these recurring spherical tropes can be found embodied within the design of dwellings, domiciles across time, and they're integrated with narratives and rituals, artifacts that really provided a kind of critical orientation uh, to the cosmic dynamics that were experienced as being animated and alive, particularly within these animistic cultures. And this perceived vault of the sky continued to be emulated within the most sacred environments of lots of civilizations, often aligned to the stars. And today, the symbolism of the spherical macrocosm centered on the axis mundi is continually embodied within many significant religious structures. Here we see within cathedrals, stupas, mosques, etc. But around 2,500 years ago, a radical new vision appeared in ancient Greece. Plato also envisioned the universe, like animistic cultures, as kind of a living spherical cosmos rotating around a central axis. But in his account of creation of the world in the Timaeus, he described God as a rational architect, a demiurge, whose mind and intention the human intellect could really imagine and understand and comprehend. And he imagined viewing the world from the outside, from the outside of the sphere, as opposed to being on the inside of the living cosmos. And it was from this transcendent perspective of the God's eye view, as we've come to know it, that this totalizing notion of cosmos and universe first appeared. A student Aristotle then extended this abstraction further, proposing that the pursuit of theoretical knowledge was really uh, one of the highest callings of philosophers and in, in, in his metaphysics, he really talked about this being governed by a kind of dualistic, non-contradictory logic that, that he'd laid out in some, some great detail that is still with us today. And he described, Aristotle described the universe as a series of perfect crystalline spheres rotated by the hand of an unmoved mover, as he called it, uh, around a static earth. This view was later famously developed by Ptolemy. And in his physics, Aristotle envisioned these spheres separating the feminine earth from the masculine heavens, insisting that Mother Earth was lowly and corruptible, while Father Heaven was, not surprisingly, divine, eternal, and immutable. And this vision of a masculine spherical cosmos was later appropriated by the medieval Catholic Church, Protestant churches as well, uh, replacing the unmoved mover with the Christian God. And they retained the idea that even though Earth was at the center of the universe, it was actually the worst place to be. We often confuse anthropocentrism with geocentrism, but this was actually kind of a, some have called it a Diablo-centric universe. Hell was at the center. 
in the 14th century, Meister Eckhart reintroduced this kind of ancient hermetic metaphor of God as an infinite sphere whose center was everywhere and circumference was nowhere. And then a century later, Nicholas of Cusa, um, a, a classic monk, transferred this to an evocative metaphor for the physical universe itself, preparing a, a really an understanding, a metaphorical understanding of a new way of seeing the cosmos. And this kind of paradoxical notion of the center being everywhere and the circumference being nowhere um, it's laid the conceptual foundations for Nicholas of Copernicus to imagine a moving earth. And like Plato, he believed the human intellect could know the mind of God. And in his 1543 book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, Copernicus proposed that the central fire of the sun was the center of the cosmos around which, of course, the earth rotated. And this has been discussed and analyzed ad, ad nauseum, um, generally under the rubric of the Copernican Revolution. And Thomas Kuhn famously coined the now much abused term paradigm shift to describe the subsequent impact of Copernicus' sun-centered universe on the European imagination. This heliocentric vision profoundly challenged the intuitive perception that the sky rotated around a static Earth. It not only cast doubt on the basic tenets of Aristotle's physics, but also on the very reliability of our senses. And the idea of heaven as a physical place, oh, excuse me, um, beyond the stars gradually dissolved. This is uh, one of the later cosmographies you can see in Copernicus's illustrations that they were contained uh, within the outer rings, the entire cosmos, and then later some other cosmographers were coming along and imagining stars outside of that, that outer sphere of the heavens. And it began to appear that the entire universe was made of the same corruptible elements as Earth. The so-called Copernican or mediocrity principle took hold with the philosophical assumption that there's nothing special or unique about humanity's home planet. So it was already seen as kind of the worst place to be, but then things got really existentially angst-ridden because it seemed like it was just the same everywhere. There was no heaven to go to. Instead of sort of dethroning Earth, it sort of dethroned heaven. And over time, new observational instruments dramatically extended the range of human perception, resulting in kind of an explosion of specialized knowledge and techniques, and it also quickened the dissolution of the heavenly spheres in the European imagination. In place of these spheres, space and time were gradually quantified as mathematical abstractions existing independently of the lived environment, the lived experience of the world, and understandable solely through the human intellect. And the predictive power of these mathematical equations and the rhetorical power of, of these mechanical devices reinforced the idea of a predictable clockwork universe that was no longer alive, but could be completely comprehended by the rational human mind. And as Peter Sloterdijk ca ca called it, this immune system of the spheres disappeared. The dualistic distinction between heaven and earth was replaced by the strengthening divisions between mind and matter, subject and object, and most importantly, today, humanity and nature. New cartographic techniques also homogenized lived places into a globalized world. We could kind of imagine everywhere as just being nowhere. And this gradual conquest of the world as a picture was what Martin Heidegger really referred to as the fundamental event of the modern age. And media devices played a pretty critical role in how it was in training our thought as well. Because the linear projections of devices like the camera obscura and the magic lantern provided new models for understanding perception and cognition. They were adopted as explanatory metaphors to describe how the external physical world enters in through the windows of the senses into the dark room of the skull. And as natural philosophy gradually morphed into modern science, increasingly it seemed that the best way to understand nature was by reducing it to its component parts. Reductionism. Uh, these abstractions <laughs> and externalities of, 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 of science were really adopted by, by global economic systems as well over time, which gradually reduced the Earth to these kind of physical resources and accelerated a kind of disenchantment with the seemingly mediocre planet and dreams of escaping to other more perfect worlds became a recurring trope within the narrative of modern progress. 
And in the 19th century, the quest for this disembodied God's eye view really became central to the belief that science could ultimately make sense of the entire machine and absolutely divorce objective facts from subjective experience and values. So that's kind of the humanities portion <laughs> of today's class. But I find it's important to actually review this kind of stuff because like it's a lot of it's addressed, you know, and has been addressed for, for, for longer than we've been alive within, within humanities, science and technology studies. But a lot of, uh, we are all living in radically different worlds. There's no telling how much of us have actually encountered some of that. I know I didn't. And so I was very interested in the role that the sphere played in shaping the way that we think about the world. And so kind of jump forward a little bit, by the 20th century, the sphere had returned. That, that the complexity of this quest became apparent when Zeiss engineers started trying to emulate the night sky and started to project on the celestial screen of the first planetarium. The, the sort of inseparability of subjectivity and objectivity became increasingly apparent. And by the way, you can see up here, the Zeiss engineers, I think it was in 1923, actually developed the first, what we now call geodesic dome that Buckminster Fuller later uh, got credit for. It seemed he developed it autonomously, but the engineers developed as, a, as kind of the strongest structure for domes. But their system, this Ptolemaic Earth-centered view of the moving sky became the hit with audiences, immersing them within the archetypal architecture of the firmament. And though they attempted this kind of mundane looking Copernican planetarium to provide a more objective view of looking at the solar system from the outside, it couldn't compete with the effective visual immersion of the Ptolemaic counterpart. And throughout the 1930s, Zeiss installed planetariums across the world, particularly in the United States, and funders hoped that they would induce a sense of cosmic unity, again, kind of back to the, the, the surround idea amongst their audiences. At the dedication of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, one speaker addressed the hope that visitors might better comprehend what he called the common fate of the human race in one spherical boat out upon the boundless ethereal sea. 1939. Um, with the introduction of film projection into domes, the combination of this Ptolemaic and Copernican views finally seemed possible. And at the 1939 World's Fair, the Hayden Planetarium teamed up with the Longines Watch Company and a guy named Fred Waller, who later developed Cinerama, to develop what they called the cinema of space and, or the theater of space and time. And visitors were taken on this kind of 15 minute simulated cosmic voyage with edge blended film projectors flying beyond the skyline of New York, past rivers on Mars, and out towards the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, which had kind of recently been understood as not the containment of the entire cosmos. Um, and at the outbreak of World War II, however, the planetarium production stopped and the Zeiss optical factories were repurposed for weaponry for the Third Reich. The technology of the theater of space and time was also transformed into a gunnery trainer for British and American pilots. But after the Third Reich's demise, the US government imported German scientists in the, into the US. And one of these famously was Werner von Braun, um, who, who became chief architect of the US space program. After the war, the American planetariums began to expand their programming, focusing on dramatic entertaining concepts as well as ideals of space travel. Uh, and in the early 1950s, the American Museum, of, the Hayden Planetarium, again at the American Museum of Natural History, hosted a series of lectures on all the ways the world might be destroyed by astronomical phenomena, which included vivid descriptions of catastrophes via asteroids, meteorites, global flooding, global drought. And they also worked with Werner von Braun to organize um, this symposia to further establish a cosmology centered around colonizing outer space. Von Braun's ideas were subsequently uh, promoted within popular media throughout the 50s uh, to turn them into reality. And that was further amplified by Von Braun's collaboration with Walt Disney, who produced a series of television shows uh, to convince Americans of the feasibility and the need to colonize space as the next frontier. And here's one of my favorite quotes from that Man in Space series, or one of my favorite clips. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Walt Disney. Thank you, Garko. In this exciting age, when everyone seems to be talking about the future possibilities of space travel, there's much speculation on what we will discover when we visit other worlds. 
Will we find planets with only a low form of vegetable life? Or will they be mechanical robots controlled by super intelligent beings? One of the most fascinating fields of modern science deals with the possibility of life on other planets. This is our story. And indeed, it became our story. As the space age took root in the 20th century, mechanistic science was augmented by spectacular tales of science fiction. Ancient visions of transcending to the heavens were replaced by dreams of escaping to other actual worlds. At the 1962 World's Fair, um, I know not human was there, I think some other folks were. Um, the United States government and Boeing Aerospace hired Cinerama, Fred Waller again, to create the ultimate cosmic journey to garner the support of the American public for funding the space race. The result was Journey to the Stars, a 10-minute simulated exploration of galaxies and planets attended by over 7 million visitors over the course of the fair. Two years later, in New York, Cinerama once again replicated this cosmic voyager with To the Moon and Beyond, which was a star attraction at the 1964 New York World's Fair. But while these efforts uh, kind of continued within the 20th century for, for visualizing, in many ways, kind of scientific ideas, we find a parallel history of spherical immersion explicitly designed to explore more the more metaphysical inner space. And this uh, kind of flagship of this project was the Rosicrucian Planetarium here in San Jose, which was the first American design planetarium that opened in 1939. Called the Theater of the Sky, it was claimed that visitors uh, could explore the mysteries of ancient mythologies connecting the macrocosm to the microcosm. And then later, at the Morrison Planetarium in Golden Gate Park, pioneering countercultural explorations of inner space were taken up, taken up in the 1950s with what were called the Vortex performances. Sound artist Henry Jacobs and filmmaker Jordan Belson uh, used sound and light to develop what Jacobs called a new form of theater based on the combination of electronics, optics, and architecture, setting the stage for later psychedelic light shows. And by the mid-1960s, filmmaker Stan Vanderbeek, who was inspired by his time as a student with Buckminster Fuller at Black Mountain College, was developing his movie drome in upstate New York. He referred to it as a rudimentary prototype for an international audiovisual research center designed to develop a new nonverbal international picture language. Sound familiar? In 1969, even Morton Helig, who's widely regarded as kind of the grandfather of virtual reality, patented the concept of a multi-sensory spherical experience theater. And a year later, immersion was once again pushed to kind of its reflexive extreme by the quite famous uh, Experiments in Arts and Technologies World Expo Pavilion in Japan, sponsored by Pepsi. Uh, engineer Billy Kluver described this as the theater of the future, a living responsive environment and a total instrument to be played by the participants in kind of ecstatic states of cybernetic bliss. And at the turn of the century, of this century, the quest for transcendence returned in, in kind of higher and more technological forms than ever imagined. It was taken up by a new generation of immersive cosmic voyagers led by the flagship this time of the Hayden Planetarium. And once again, it built on this recurring trope of flights through the heavens so that these digital planetariums could continue to cultivate public interest in space exploration by purporting to provide scientifically accurate tours to the cosmos. When I went into the Hayden Archives and I was looking for the information about the 1939 World's Fair, nobody that had worked on this project knew about the project exactly 60 years earlier that had almost an identical flight path. So there was something quite interesting about the ways in which this was evoking a particular imagination. And within you know, the single generation of all of this happening, we actually did achieve escape velocity. I mean, we traveled to other planets, went to the moon, but when our probes arrived on Mars, there were no intelligent robots to be found other than our own. And not only were there no, as Disney called them, low forms of vegetable life, which he kind of set as the lowest common denominator, there was no life at all. And if you've been following the MAVEN mission lately, um, you know, the findings of actual conditions for life on Mars are getting more and more harsh. And really, thanks to the space age, thanks to industrialization, we've actually discovered that we can't take the conditions for life for granted. And as we've been dreaming of life on other worlds and escaping from this one, we've been transforming many parts of our own planet into alien landscapes. We don't have to really go that far to see what inhospitable environments look like. Just go to West Virginia, close to where I'm from, where ancient mountains are being decimated by the coal industry. 
or to Alberta and Canada where wild boreal forests are being raised to access the tar sands. In the past decade, resilient scientists have really envisioned a new kind of sphere to quantify many of the critical thresholds of planetary life support systems, not just climate change, but also biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, freshwater use, and many, many other interconnected issues. In their words, we're tipping towards the unknown, engaged in a high stakes game of unwittingly crossing planetary boundaries that define a safe operating space for humanity. And as has been noted, we're discovering that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the planetary biosphere, not the other way around. According to the Global Footprint Network, we've been going into ecological debt every year for the past four decades, exceeding the capacity of Earth's ability to regenerate the resources we're consuming. And in an ironically anthropocentric ge gesture, the term Anthropocene, the age of humans, has been proposed to describe the current geologic epoch. I'm curious, how many of you have heard this term? I'm impressed. Generally, I've mentioned this before in talks, and it's extraordinary like how much press this has gotten, but it still isn't a widely understood concept. So these epochs are generally defined by the ability to see clear boundaries between layers of rocks. And the idea of the Anthropocene is that steam engines, the Industrial Revolution, nuclear explosions, thermoelectric power, highways, and, and increasingly what we heard of yesterday is the stack, the planetary computational scale systems, are leaving an indelible chemical impression on the geology of our planet. The notion of the Anthropocene captures the spirit of this ambivalent era when increased access to modern conveniences have been accompanied by widespread ecological degradation. And paradoxically, the notion of the Anthropocene also effectively dissolves the dualistic distinction between humans and nature that was really at a cornerstone of modern science. They call them social ecological systems. So some have even pointed out that this is not really so much a function of humanity as it is a function of kind of hyper neoliberal capitalism, proposing that it might be more effectively and more, more accurately called the capitalocene. And this ability to modify ecosystems at a planetary scale evidences a profound conundrum underlying how we direct the power of human ingenuity. The radical fragmentation of knowledge has really made it very difficult to comprehend or make sense of any kind of big picture because there are now over 8,000 academic disciplines, 50,000 specialized journals, and over a million uh, articles published every year. And this visualization of academic references from UCSD kind of shows how rarely uh, disciplines draw on knowledge from other fields within their publications. So, Buckminster Fuller, he, uh, was going to be dropped out of this talk because trying to talk about him within the span of 30 minutes <laughs> is, is pretty impossible. But he anticipated many of the consequences of this excessive reductionism, abstraction, and specialization, and in no uncertain yet often mad maddeningly verbose terms. He, he saw the industrial technologies of the space age as critical for extending the senses to perceive what he called the 99.9% .9 of phenomena occurring beyond the, the visible, the audible, the smellable, and the touchable realms. And as an antidote, he developed a more integrative approach that he called comprehensive anticipatory design science, describing its practitioners, primarily himself, as an emerging synthesis of artist, inventor, mechanic, objective economist, and evolutionary strategist. And he addressed this in the introduction to Gene Youngblood's expanded cinema, he contended that the media arts and, and, and technolo media technologies would play a critical role in what he called the design science revolution. He insisted that network technologically assisted experiential learning environments were key to essential reorientations to our cosmic and planetary home. He also insisted that we live on a spaceship. This was probably one of the things that he was most known for and he, he was really encouraging us to uh, in his kind of famous framing, take our responsibilities for being astronauts aboard Spaceship Earth. And today, uh, the fruits of this industrial age and the space age are really indeed providing more dynamic views. So the idea of the whole Earth, this, this image that transformed or is credited with transforming consciousness in the 1960s, is kind of radically changing because it's not just kind of a static 2D image, but we have webs now of Earth observing and communication satellites that are helping us to understand our home in new ways. They're providing profound insights into the impacts of human civilization. 
across all these different types of scales, spatial, spectral, temporal, as well as giving us the opportunity to visualize all kinds of information. These eyes in the skies are really allowing us to directly experience, as Fuller anticipated, uh, invisible phenomena, utilizing the data and the capacity for computing power. And as a consequence, we keep discovering previously invisible interactions that conspire to support life here, not the least of which is the Earth's magnetic field, which we now understand is a function of the moon's gravity. I think it's something like 3.7 terawatts constantly that we're getting just from gravi gravity and spin that's generating this effective you know, force field protecting our planet from all of these solar winds uh, that are constantly bombarding us. Without this, we wouldn't have the atmosphere, we wouldn't have the oceans. By visualizing these previously invisible patterns and relationships, we can start to gain a deeper appreciation of what Fuller would call the synergistic conditions for life, the kind of emergent properties that are unpredicted by the sum of the parts. For instance, the satellite uh, data of these surface flows from NASA, as well as <coughs> some wind currents, show how fresh water moves in vortices between the oceans and the atmosphere. And these currents are also distributing solar energy to regulate the Earth's climate. Uh, the planetary temperatures are equalized by the cold air and surface water is moving towards the equator, while warm, warm air and water moves towards the poles. Of course, this is kind of the concern with Greenland, that if Greenland goes, starts to cool down this, this conveyor belt, that essentially Europe freezes over. We also now know that Earth is the only planet in the habitable zone of our own solar system. That means that we have the necessary temperatures to support abundant liquid water on its surface. But everybody's familiar with this solar system model, right? Like everybody, you recognize this as the solar system. It's, <laughs> sorry, I really don't mean to be condescending, but my mind gets blown constantly at how much I don't know, like how ignorant I am by trying to engage this material. Because these are all, like there's so many things that are not part of the current educational system that, that is extraordinary. So we're all being taught this incredibly outdated model of the solar system. Fuller attempted to actually uh, relate this in his book Synergetics, where he was arguing the sun actually moves. Like why in all of these models do we never see the sun moving? So we now really understand that the sun is orbiting around the galactic core of the Milky Way at about half a million miles an hour with us in tow. And our planet really does start to resemble a kind of regenerative living spaceship. I mean, it's not even so metaphorical. It's just a really neat science fiction trope. And increasingly, media arts and technology can play a critical role in accelerating our attunement to these complex ecological patterns that are both inside and without. And this potential has really been driven home most spectacularly by the cosmic atlas developed by the Hayden Planetarium. It was inspired by Charles and Ray Eames' Power of Ten, curated by the Hayden. And so basically this is, I'm gonna zoom out in one minute, something that I usually do in about an hour, um, but it's gonna start increasing in speed uh, as we're zooming out and it's uh, as well as compressing space so that we can begin to see the dynamics of the solar system, still not taking into account the movement of the sun, but we're at one hour away from home, we're at one light day, we begin to see the constellations, but it's a 3D map of the stars, so you start to see the constellations and their true relationship to how we observe them. We see the radio sphere in space, we begin to zoom out like in the New York World's Fair outside of our galaxy, we start to see all of these galactic surveys, each containing billions of stars to the point where we're at 100 million light years. Finally, we get to this large scale structure of galaxies and the places that we can't actually see that we failed to map to the point where we actually pop outside of our own cosmic horizon, the cosmic microwave background. Got that? Do you notice anything funny? <laughs> so, I first saw this at Burning Man. Um, we did a project and, and we were sitting in a dome we made and I had this company, we we're making these lenses and the guy Carter who curated this thing was like, hey, come to the, you know, come help us out. And when he got to this point, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, this is another one of those things, like, am I that ignorant? Like, what, what's going on with this? And so I, I spent a number of years really trying to understand, but what this, what this is, is really pushing the transcendent view of this God's eye 
this God's eye view, this transcendent dream to its virtual extreme. And we encounter this irony of really cosmic proportions. That within this new cosmic model, which back of the napkin sketches is about $10 billion worth of scientific research, Earth is at the center surrounded by this spherical horizon. That we are in what astronomers call our own observational center of space-time, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It's, it's an inevitable artifact of attempting to map and model phenomena through the technological extensions of our senses. We are situated in this particular place, in this particular time, and as light from phenomena reaches us, it's all non-simultaneous, light has a speed limit, so we're seeing things further and further back in the past the further out we look. And we're also looking all around us, so we're creating this kind of omnidirectional view. Or in layman's VR terms, this is basically a spherical panorama, right? But it's limited by the speed of light, which, which really means that this neo-geocentric cosmic model embodies the medieval paradox of the infinite sphere, that the center is everywhere, that there's a self-conscious observer. This just happens to be our center, and the circumference is nowhere. It's really an illusion of the sphere created by our efforts to map the earliest light coming at us post the Big Bang, at least of course, uh, according to modern cosmology. And one of the most interesting aspects of this that I found is that we also have to really consider Earth as our ecological center, that it's, it, it's our true axis Monday, that the more we look out, the more we're having to look in, the more we're having to understand all of these synergistic connections and, and relationships that are on this planet. As we've attempted to domesticate the universe, we've discovered the need to really begin reorienting ourselves to our cosmic and planetary home. Because the concept of the Anthropocene really does dissolve that human nature boundary, we need to question these fundamental paradigmatic assumptions that are still driving, in particular, not science so much, because science has been adapting to the complexity and the emergence and all kinds of things, but the global economic system. It's still based on this idea of scarcity and linearity, that these are the very things that Fuller was challenging. And our species' collective future is really dependent on our ability to integrate the technologies that we create into the regenerative capacity and the living systems of this planet. And I was gonna end there, but I thought it was sort of insightful to, uh, when, I, when, I, when I ran across this, this definition from Fuller again of technology, because it's, it's another one of those tricky terms. And he defines technology as, as this. In its complexities of design integrity, the universe is technology. The technology evolved by man is thus far amateurish compared to the elegance of non-humanly contrived regeneration. Man does not spontaneously recognize technology other than his own, so he speaks of the rest as something he ignorantly calls nature. And so that idea, I think, is one of the most important thought forms of the 21st century. That as we start to look around and we start to study these these cycles and the regenerative patterns all around us as we start to understand and mediate reality across all these different scales. The one of the most important things, if not the most important things we could be doing as, as media artists, I think, is to help attune our consciousness to the nature of what is required to exist within these scales of living systems. They're these nested scales that we need to be adding value to, not degenerating, but actively participating within the regeneration. And since Unbeknownst to me, Barry actually posted this to the, the, the front page of uh, this conference website. I thought it'd be helpful to sort of uh, invite you to participate in the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, which this is a, a project we've been doing for the past nine years at the Buckminster Fuller Institute that's designed to meet the goal of what he called the world game. That he was looking for projects tapping into these regenerative technologies that could help design a world that would work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And in terms of an intention, it's, it's over the years really become one of my favorite mantras. And 
last year we received uh, submissions from over 100 different countries, and it's an incredible community of people, and I would really uh, love to engage anyone here that's interested uh, in, in learning more, because what we're really, really missing is mediation and the stories and the experiments of how it is we begin to visualize what this looks like, because these are extraordinary systemic projects, but they're so busy doing their things that they don't have generally the skills and the chops to actually explain the systemic integrative nature of what they're up to. Thanks.